all of the representatives of Esri are knowledgeable and well-meaning and informed and influential and worth your paying attention to. But that being true for everybody you're going to hear from, it is especially true for Jack Dangermont, of course, who was the uh, founder of the company, who you heard from early on. It's also especially true of Chris Capelli, the director you're about to hear from. He's somebody who matters in all of your lives if you are Esri customers and uh, relying on its technology and its applications. Chris has been the, with the company for 26 years. Um, that's from, from its early days. He's from Pennsylvania originally. He is, you all, many of you know that Penn State is a real fount of GIS expertise. Chris is a Penn State uh, grad. He was originally trained in physics and astrophysics there. He still operates his own observatory in Redlands, California. When I was a kid growing up in Redlands, it would, there would be, have been no point in having an observatory because you'd only see like four feet up into the smog layer. But now that, that since California is cleaner, the observatory works. And I gather that Chris's uh, either a daughter, I believe, has just graduated from uh, Penn State again with a degree in, in journalism and, and GIS. So, uh, so Chris has, one of the things he does is to travel the world of GIS users, of, in the public uh, sphere, in private companies, and NGOs, in all sorts of operations to see what is working and what is not. And what he's going to tell us about in his next presentation is the 12 lessons he has learned by traveling the world of, of your corporations and others, your organizations and others, and saying, here is something that works, here is something that could be improved, and what this means if you are a GIS user for having maximal success with the software. So I give you Chris Capelli with his 12 secrets of success with GIS. Thank you for coming back after lunch. I'm always nervous about, about that. So let's just dive right into um, to some of these observations. First and foremost, I think like many of you, uh, I'm an, a student of the trends, uh, sometimes tumultuous, that drive the, our ecosystem of business and government all over the world. Uh, I always look to organizations like IDC and Gartner to really give me a, a strong foundation in what's going on. But I also look at your organizations, your desires, and your vision to try to ground truth these uh, to the realities um, that are necessary to drive our business forward. Because as Jack said this morning, our mission is to support your mission. Uh, so in looking at these various trends, you know, I heard a lot of them referenced, uh, like blockchains, digital transformation, uh, as we uh, went through the morning presentations. But there was one that was actually distinctly missing that I wanted to highlight, and that's this concept of the digital twin. If you're like me, the first time that you thought about maybe the digital twin, uh, you got a little bit of uh, science fiction rolling in your mind. Uh, harken back to 1984, or Snow Crash, and you've probably got a clear picture of what a digital twin could be if it became the evil digital twin. The notion's actually not that far-fetched because many of you are wearing digital twin devices. You wear a Fitbit, or you wear a smartwatch, or you carry a smartphone. Uh, that is all capturing information about your digital life and about your physical life. That manifestation is building and especially starting to pop out in many industries. Now, where this has really taken root, obviously, is in the industry of manufacturing. It is conceivable that those of you who flew on a, a commercial flight to get here to San Diego for this week actually had an accompanying digital twin that stalked your physical flight. I find that actually a remarkable thing because the digital twin is not only a manifestation of the physical, it's also a current understanding of what it is and what it could be. And I think this is an exciting uh, trend for all of us to consider in our strategies as we move forward. Now, the, it's not too hard to apply this notion of a digital twin into smart cities and into smart organizations. You've heard smart come uh, repeatedly from the presentations, and I think it's a firm foundation and an ideal state that we all look for. Uh, as somebody who works for Jack, I, I idealize providing the smart uh, organization uh, that responds to the challenges he gives us. Um, but I think, ultimately, when you look at the concept of digital twin, it's, it's actually 
something that you're all quite familiar with because it's why you probably use GIS. It's just a new name for it. So with GIS, you're capturing the digital twin of your ecosystem. And I would argue that you're leveraging technologies to make your digital twin uh, probably with greater fidelity of the physical manifestation of your organization. You're using real-time feeds, you're using all source information to gather an up-to-date view of your organization's status and performance. You're also, as Jack mentioned earlier from UPS, starting to use that in a forward-leaning way to gain insight into how you should make decisions, where you could optimize, and how you could improve the physical manifestation of your digital environment. So I thought, you know, get out of the trends, because those things are, to me, blockchains, uh, digital transformation, digital twins are all essential for planning the next strategy of your organization. To ground back into reality, which is often my job, is to really think about GIS in a simple way. And for me, the simplest definition I can give is that GIS helps people understand how location and geography affect their decisions. Look no further than Google Maps or Apple Maps on your device conveniently, ensuring that you're never lost. That's a remarkable thing. Now imagine applying that inside of your organization to the rest of the decisions that you make. Not just impacting whether you turn left or turn right or go straight, but also understanding all the inflection points within your decisions that your workforce makes in any given moment, in any given day, in any given scenario. I think that's the underpinning of why you invest your resources and time in having a GIS system. It gives you that sense of uh, capability, but also a sense of assurance that you understand you are making decisions based on the best available information in the most confident way possible at the time. What I wanted to share was an example of how a user, because it's quite fascinating to see all the breadth of users who leverage the concepts uh, of GIS across the organization. And this one in the last year has really struck me just from the basic notion of its simplicity of the impact that GIS is having in an organization in very simple, small, meaningful ways, helping people do their work better. So let me play this video. Pinellas County is on the west central coast of Florida. We are the most densely populated county in Florida. We have one million residents. Within 276 square miles, we have 24 individual cities that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. We have about 35 miles of coastline. We're also unique because we are a peninsula within a peninsula. And so we are affected by things like sea level rise and global climate change more than many other communities. We're surrounded almost completely by open water, Tampa Bay, Intercoastal Waterway, as well as the Gulf of Mexico and you add that subtropical climate to all the water and all the development, and you have a flood problem. A state of emergency today as Tropical Storm Colin hit the panhandle hard, dumping over seven inches of rain in Pinellas During Tropical Storm Colin in 2016, we worked with our GIS team to develop a viewer, and the viewer basically um, mapped all of our work requests that came in during the storm and it just gave us a better situation awareness. So we basically developed it on the fly and tweaked it during the storm. And then we prepped for doing the exact same thing before Hurricane Hermine hit. During Hurricane Hermine, we were using the map apps to update the information that we were receiving. We were updating the road closures. We could see where our trucks were. Trees down were marked with a different symbology so that everybody using the map apps could see what was going on. We could dispatch crews to locations that were next to our emergency response teams addressing another call. We knew exactly where everything was. We've really kind of leveraged ArcGIS Collector for field data operations. The one in particular that I think has been probably the most successful is our sign inventory. We started using Collector App to collect all the signs within Pinellas County. With the application, our staff is carrying around an iPad and they go up to a sign, they take a photo of the front and the back and attach it to the point where the sign is and move on to the next sign. So this has really helped our county know what we have out there and what we need to have supplies for in case of a natural disaster. 
we look at a holistic view of GIS, not just a view at each, each individual agency or constitutional. It enables us to look at enterprise GIS from a futuristic point of view of where, as a smart county, we want to go. Web GIS, I think, is the next logical extension of making accessibility um, the standard for uh, all of our citizens, whether they're using a mobile device, uh, a desktop, or any flavor of browser, they need to be able to get to that information. And the Esri tools, along with our web access and mobile access, really make that possible. Everybody can just go to our wealth of information on the flood information website, including links to all these map applications. You just type your address in and it takes you right to the lot and it shows you what flood zone you're in. Is there an elevation certificate? Are there wetlands on my property? A big component of floodplain management in the county is our community rating system. The community rating system is put out under the National Flood Insurance Program and it rewards communities with flood insurance premium discounts based on how far above and beyond you are going than the federal requirements. And one of the major components of that is outreach and education. And these map applications are a very good way to relay that flood hazard message to your constituents. We're now saving over $5.2 million a year across unincorporated Pinellas County in flood insurance premiums. So all our residents, businesses, any county buildings, anybody that's in the floodplain is getting the biggest discount that you can get on an insurance premium. The next three years I see as kind of a renaissance for enterprise GIS in the county where we're not doing the things that we have to do in order to kind of build the foundation for enterprise GIS. Um, we're going to be doing the things that the businesses want us to do. Whether it's knowing uh, where your infrastructure is throughout the county and making better planning decisions based on that, or being able to analyze socio-demographic uh, trends and making strategic investments to lift everyone in the community, that is going to pay back for generations. Pretty amazing what Pinellas County has been able to do with GIS. Now, how many of you have children? Now, uh, do they listen to you? I was just trying to get some advice back. Um, my daughter is coming down. I told her you didn't have to. She's coming down anyway. I, um, so she may walk in the back of the room and say, hey, Dad, I'm here. So I didn't want to embarrass anybody. Um, but I've always tried to give my kids you know, general advice. And uh, I feel a little bit, um, well, nervous giving uh, senior executives like yourselves advice. So take this as uh, Chris's observations as a computational geographer, as a father, and as a leader of business at Esri. These are observations that I've made. First and foremost, you're not alone. There are thousands of organizations who are applying GIS technology in order to support the operations of their business. They run in scale from very small, very humble, to very intricate, very complex, and very uh, well executed in every dimension. The thing about GIS that most impresses me is it's able to scale to meet the demand of business, both small and large. And I think that's the first key takeaway. As you think about meeting others tomorrow as you enter the mainstream of the conference, please keep in mind you're seeing a cross-section of organizations, big and small, from all over the world. They are all equally feeling some measure of business success as a result of applying a geographic approach and using GIS technology. Because as Jack said, it's certainly not just the technology. So my 12 points are gonna really lean more in that dimension. So again, 12 simple ideas. The, the first, uh, as a fellow executive, I would suggest that as any other information technology and any other system or approach that you marry to your strategies and your vision, it's essential to set extremely high expectations. It's easy to, to find fault in any dimension of one's strategy, but what I find is that you're, in many regards, not setting high enough expectations for your GIS program. So I would humbly suggest that it's okay, push a little bit harder, they can take it, your GIS professionals are professionals, they are desiring attention from you and desiring the, the permission to go and explore taking your GIS capabilities to another level. The second thing is that in some organizations, you see GIS 
leverage as an enterprise asset, and others you don't. So if you don't look at your GIS system the same way as you look at your CRM or ERP systems, I would urge you to take a fresh look at how the GIS system can marry exactly into the strategies and business objectives and outcomes that you envision for both the remainder of this year and into the next five-year planning cycle that you may be using. Because GIS as a complete system, if you were to think about nothing more than these six pillars, would allow you to see that it has relevance in each of your key mission areas. From being able to just simply enable your workforce to easily discover, use, and make and share a map from any device, just as they would if they were lost using Google Maps or Apple Maps, you want them having the ability to leverage your maps, your authoritative content, to make those split decisions that happen thousands of times during the business day. Next, many of you are engaging your constituents or finding new ways to engage your constituents from open data and beyond to applications which really allow you to source information from your citizens or your, your stakeholders or your stockholders to being able to provide better information to them so that they are more informed and aware of the services that you provide. But moving across the list, you, you get the idea. Next, integrate with your other mission systems and data assets. This is a key one and one that I have to be uh, honest, I don't see uh, well executed in many organizations. Location can become your pan-ultimate foreign key for you database uh, aficionados because it is the one thing that every database shares in common because everything is somewhere. And by being able to put it on a map, you can use that commonality to unify different operational systems and data sets to provide you with that ultimate common operational picture so that you can see how different siloed systems actually interplay with one another to make better, more informed decisions. I would also suggest there is great evidence that your teams are unleashing the power of spatial analysis at a scale that's unprecedented. In the last two years, I've seen an increased not only demand, but application of the language of spatial analysis. I'm not just seeing it from your technical people, I'm actually starting to see your business people speaking with these, for lack of a better way, geographic primitives for language. Being able to apply these and chain them together in the context of your business to both optimize and understand and to be able to strategically plan forward for the future. One thing you saw in the Pinellas video which continually strikes me is everything was out of the box configured. It wasn't custom code. They took existing applications, configured them, and rapidly deployed them. This agility not only has technical merit, the agility has business merit, as you know. It allows you to move fast, make mistakes fast, and fix mistakes fast, which I think is an essential in today's business environment. Next, my advice to you, especially those of you who have data scientists and are spending money in analytics and business intelligence, is to start to vector your GIS professionals into that same area. Because in a way, your GIS professionals are data scientists. They're a data scientist who understands the impacts of location and geography on business decisions. Pull them from the mundane tasks of managing systems and being a system administrator and put them into forward-leaning positions where they're close to the edges of your business so they can bring that spatial awareness and language of spatial analytics right to the forefront of where decisions are made in your business. This one seems simple, and I think in the last year, I've seen a massive acceleration of this. Create a destination inside your org of your organization where every employee and contractor knows they can go to get the authoritative maps and information about how your organization's assets and resources are spread across your geographies. Because having those maps at somebody's fingertips has become an essential in business. This then, of course, puts more responsibility on making useful maps. If Roger Tomlinson was here, this was chapter six right out of his book. Useful information products help decision makers make better, more informed decisions. 
What I do at Esri is, for running our business, I have a series of information products that allow me to understand both our, our performance, our lagging indicators, and also our leading indicators. I'm able to use maps and geographic analysis for both understanding in mass how we're doing and where we should be doing better. So maps have become a strategic tool for how we manage our organization, and I know they're a strategic tool for your organization. Push them forward and push them outwards so that everybody across your organization can make those key decisions. This, of course, means empowering everybody with apps. The democratization of mapping has already happened. It's just not happened with your authoritative information. It's time to take that back for those of you who haven't done this and enable your workforce to leverage those with convenient apps that work on any device, anywhere, at any time. Make your authoritative maps convenient and easy for people to access with the information they need. As executives, we all know there is no perfect organizational structure. I know this is something I am constantly challenged by, trying to look to see what's working, what to adjust, what to, what to do to stimulate the creativity of our workforce so they can better meet the demands of your workforce. I would only suggest that you place your GIS resources appropriate to match your desired outcomes. In some cases, that means pushing them forward into the field so they can have the most impact on your short-term objectives. In some cases, it means pulling them back into your office so they can help understand your strategy for the future and help you factor geography into that to have a location strategy for your organization to support your mission objectives. Of course, number 11, promoting a culture, irregardless of how you've organized, of collaboration is essential. The one thing that's characteristic about a GIS professional, which you will see evidence of tomorrow, is sharing and collaboration. Our community is small enough and likes each other enough to be able to break down silos both within organizations and across organizations. We all know as leaders, we set the culture of our organizations, and one of those key cultures is collaboration. Enable your, your entire workforce to collaborate using maps. I'd be remiss if I didn't take my own biggest lesson learned from spending millions of dollars on an information technology to support my business. You have to be viewed as user number one of your GIS system because your involvement as user number one of your system shows your entire workforce your commitment to leverage the same authoritative information so that it's not just a reporting system, it's a system that helps you make better decisions and is put in place to help them do their work better, smarter, faster, so that they can enjoy the other things in life that are so important to them. I think each and every one of you is a role model for this. So of all the characteristics of my 12, I knew this would be the one that you already could have checked off because it's an essential. And it's probably the most fun system that you have to work in, isn't it? Can you all pull up a map right now of your organization's status and performance? I leave you with one thing I learned from a user two years ago. This is a user in a small city in Florida. She actually made this button and gave it to me last year, and I, I have carried it around ever since then. Muscle memory is something we all deal with as executives in our organizations. I'd encourage you to give permission to your workforce to do things differently when it comes to GIS. GIS is a prominent technology that has a place in your business, not only as an information technology, but as an approach for enabling people to be creative in how they solve problems and help you reach your vision and goals. Thank you very much.